We're going to talk about what could be the nation's fastest growing sport, maybe even in the world. Um, but we're going to find out a little bit more about that. And I'm really thrilled to have some incredible guests with us tonight. Uh, one of our guests is actually going to take over and be a guest host. So that makes my job so much easier tonight. And I'm thrilled to welcome Jason Aspis. Jason is a Maccabi USA alum. He represented Maccabi USA in Masters Basketball in the 20th Maccabi on Israel in 2017. When COVID hit in early 2020, Jason was introduced to pickleball and he absolutely fell in love with the sport. He is the co-founder of The Kitchen. Uh, many of you may be tuning in from your kitchen tonight, but The Kitchen <laughs> is actually the largest and most engaging online pickleball community. And he is working hard on the court to one day beat one of our guests, Deck El Bar. But I'm gonna let Jason get to all those details and lead us tonight. So Jason, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. It's great to see you. Thank you, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I found uh, Pickleball about a year and a half ago and absolutely fell in love. And, uh, and I'm excited about the progression that it's been making and that we have two fantastic guests um, to, to talk to tonight. We have uh, Seymour Rifkin. Seymour is the president and founder of the International Pickleball Teaching Professional Association, which is a mouthful, but that yeah. acronym is IPTPA. Uh, he also serves as president of the Pickleball Hall of Fame, and he founded the World Pickleball Federation. So this riff, as he is known, has, uh, has done just about everything in pickleball. And so we're really excited to have him here tonight. Riff, welcome. Thank How's you. It going? Great to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you. And also we have Dekel Barr. Dekel is from Tel Aviv, Israel. He is currently in Mexico on a pickleball getaway. Uh, he's currently ranked number three, three-ish, I think, in the world in pickleball. He's a former Davis Cup tennis player from Israel and now resides in Austin, Texas and plays pickleball professionally. Dekel, thanks for joining us. How are you? Good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to this. Yeah. Um, Dekel and I actually just got to play last week in, in Austin, Texas. Um, Deckel, are you recovering well? I just want to make sure you're okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, how's your partner doing? <laughs> He's a little banged up, I got to be honest. Yeah, actually, uh, Jason got me pretty good. Uh, so he's got some it, good shots. It, it was a physical contest. Uh, it was, definitely was. Typically, pickleball is not that physical. But, you know, we, we, uh, we were playing at a very high level, I have to say. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, I, you know, Guys, I want to get into pickleball. How you guys came about and found the sport, Riff. Let's start with you. How did you find pickleball? How did how did it? You know, when was it, and how did you find it? So uh, I've I've heard about pickleball for probably twenty five years. Uh, I've have a bunch of friends, fellow coaches that retired in the villages, uh, and so they've been telling me about this game for a long time. And I just said, pickleball, come on, give me a break. Uh, you know, this did not sound appealing. Plus, I was so busy, I never had time for to, to, to even think about it. But uh, I retired in 2005. And then um, one of the things I had on my bucket list, I'm a big football fan and a Bears fan. I'm from Chicago. So I wanted to kind of go around and uh, see the Bears play at all these stadiums. So I was down in uh, North Carolina one weekend. And the following weekend, I was going to have to go to Atlanta. Rather than going home, I went to visit my buddies in the villages. For those that don't know, uh, the villages uh, turned out, started out as just a 55 plus community, but it grew so quickly that there are literally 125,000 people that live there now, and it's a city. And they've got like 230 courts and 30,000 pickleball players. So it's the largest congregation of pickleball players anywhere in the world. And uh, so I went down there, met my buddies, we played some golf, played some tennis, and then finally they said, let's go to the pickleball course. So I said, okay, five minutes, <laughs> that was it. My life turned upside down. And uh, you know, my, all the plans that I had with my wife and family about traveling the world uh, changed you know, <laughs> almost immediately. Cause I started playing pickleball every day, sometimes twice a day. And uh, you know, it's a similar story that you hear from a lot of people. You know, it doesn't take much to get hooked on the game. 
Yeah, that's true. It, 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 it's a lot like drugs and gambling. It, it, it's a vice, <laughs> but it's a healthy. But it's a healthy one. It's yeah. a healthy vice. So it's it's this really it has this very addictive quality to it. But yeah. it's a good it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So we'll get to that in a minute. Death will tell us about your journey into pickleball. How did you find the sport, and how long have you been playing? Yeah. Uh, so I've been. I was a tennis player uh, from uh, from a young age until uh, probably about five or six years ago, five years. Uh, and I used to travel uh, for tennis tournaments with uh, Colin Johns, Ben Johns' brother. So Ben has been the, the best player in the last uh, few years. Um, and uh, Ben introduced myself and Colin together to pickleball once we were done uh, with tennis. Uh, so that's how I, I found pickleball. I had a, a good teacher to, to, help me, to help me start. And uh, at first I was a little bit skeptical. Uh, the first time I, first couple of times I played, I liked it, but I'm like, you know, uh, I like tennis better. The more, the more I played pickleball, the, like every time it was more intriguing, it got more fun, uh, more addictive. And now, uh, yeah, n never, never looked back since. <laughs> That's great. So Riff, tell us a little bit about your, your, your role in the sport. I know you have some big news that people might not know about Maccabi and pickleball. But tell us yeah. about your role, what you've been doing, and, and how you're helping to grow the sport. Yeah. So, um, you know, when, when I got introduced to pickleball, uh, I played a lot of different sports. Uh, and um, I fortunately, I played at a high level at, at several of them. My, my initial sport that I loved was gymnastics. And uh, I competed in the eighth Maccabea game in 1969, winning a gold and bronze medal. And that feeling of representing your country um, is something that is just, you know, to this day, I hear the, our national anthem and, and I, I get goosebumps, you know, there's, there's nothing better than that. So when I found pickleball um, and there was, it was treated sort of as like a backyard game, you know, uh, nobody really knew anything about the fundamentals of the game. Uh, there, there was never any agreement. There was, nobody was actually coaching. Nobody was making any money. And so, you know, my dream early on, because I love the sport so much is, you know, why, why can't we make this thing to be more professional? And, and it's got to start first with a teaching organization. So um, I uh, reached out to the top 20 players in the world back in 2015 at nationals, um, reached out to everybody ahead of, ahead of time and planned for a day where I would lay out a strategic plan of what I thought our sport needed to take that first step towards, you know, being accepted uh, as an international sport. And all the top players in the world at that time said, yes, this is exactly what we need. And, you know, from there, IPTPA got launched. Uh, so that, that's how the teaching organization started. Um, you know, we, we started certifying players back uh, in April of 2016. Uh, and then as I got to, to know some of the top players and uh, some became really good friends with, with people that have been around for a long time. Um, you know, I recognized that, you know, we need to have uh, a hall of fame like any other sport does. And uh, we had three in people that invented the game. Two of them had already passed away. And the, the, the remaining uh, inventor was already like 88 years old. And the first president of the USAP was uh, you know, in his late 80s. And the guy that invented the modern paddle was in his late 80s. And, you know, pretty, it became very apparent that, you know, if we didn't do it and do it quickly, we'd be creating a memorial for all these people rather than giving them an opportunity to be honored. So uh, again, you know, three or four months later, uh, we had the Pickleball Hall of Fame up and running. So that's, uh, you know, those two organizations. And then uh, in in February of 2019, uh, I started the World Pickleball Federation because I was traveling all over the world uh, because of my teaching organization, trying to help countries to you know, learn the game the correct way because the game is easy um, and it's easy to just come out as a tennis player. I, Deco, when you, you were very fortunate because you got taught by, by, by Ben, but I'm sure you know of other tennis players that just, you know, they use their tennis skills uh, when they first get on the court and they're basically playing tennis on a pickleball court with a paddle, right? And, For sure, and, and, it's, a, it's an adjustment. Until, yeah, until they, you know, kind of get put in their place by a real pickleball player that has uh, an equal set of skills, um, it, 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 you can kind of go down the wrong direction. And so, um, you know, it became very important to be able to have quality teachers 
uh, around the world. And so I did a lot of traveling. And, and when I traveled, you know, I would ask people if they were members of, of, of another international organization, if they were happy with the support they were getting. And there really wasn't any support that was taking place. So um, I simply asked the question, if, if, if there was another organization and you had an option, would you be interested in, in joining that organization? And, you know, I got pretty much unanimous yeses. So that's how WPF got started. So That's great. Well, Deckel, tell me, what are you, first of all, what are you doing down in Mexico? Uh, I'm on a pickable getaway in uh, Mexico. Uh, it's uh, me and Ben have a, we, have, we do trips uh, overseas. So right now we're in uh, the Mayan Riviera. Uh, we got 80, 80 people here with us uh, playing pickleball oh. every day. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. That sounds like fun. So, Yako, tell us, how, how is the tr transition going from tennis to pickleball? And then as a follow-up question, how do you describe pickleball to people who don't know the sport? Uh, all right, I'll start with a second question. How would you describe? I would, I would say it's a smaller, uh, smaller tennis with, you know, obviously different rules uh, in between tennis and ping pong and badminton size court. Uh, that would be the, the easiest uh, explanation. Obviously, it's a little bit different, but that would be uh, uh, the best, my best go-to. Um, the transition from tennis to pickleball, um, that uh, there's a lot of different uh, shots and a lot of different skills that you need to, uh, uh, to forget from tennis and, and learn again in pickleball. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of similarities in, in, in terms of uh, your, your skill set, maybe, uh, but a lot of shots are very different. And if you try to hit your tennis shots, uh, they're not gonna, most of them are not gonna work on the pickleball court. So you really have to relearn a lot of shots, uh, kind of uh, uh, test your brain a little bit or, or learn, you know, teach your brain to, to uh, forget the old habits and uh, kind of get some new ones because uh, it, uh, it is definitely different. Uh, so it takes time. Uh, at first, you, some people just wanna, just wanna hit hard everything and that works in, uh, to a certain extent, but definitely not if you want to improve and get to a higher level. And so you're one of the top professionals in the world. How much training are you doing to get to where you are today? Uh, so I'm, I'm playing every day, uh, playing uh, two or three hours a day, trying to do uh, conditioning uh, almost every day. Uh, it really depends on, my, um, on the travel schedule, if it's uh, at a tournament, before a tournament, how long of a break we have. Uh, the last year was pretty intense uh, uh, in terms of travel for tournaments. So it, it was uh, sometimes harder to, to practice because you're just going from, uh, from tournament to tournament and every tournament is you know, three, four intense days. Then you need a day or two to, uh, to recover and you're right back on the next one. So uh, if like now I had a few weeks off uh, from tournaments, so it's uh, training every day, uh, three, four hours, including uh, uh, conditioning, uh, trying, uh, you know, obviously nutrition, um, stretching, everything, all that. Uh, yeah. I would say it's very, very similar to tennis and the, and the top levels and it's getting more and more professional. Yeah, for sure. We've seen that. And, you know, obviously with all the professional tours now, multiple professional tours, uh, you know, it, it's great for the sport. It's bringing in new audience. And I think one of the things that we didn't discuss was the strategic side or the mental side of the sport right where mm -hmm. tennis, ping pong batman they're they're more physical right a lot of it relies on your physicality and, and your ability right. to hit the shot whereas pickleball you can really be neutralized with strategy and that's what i love about the sport that you have yeah. no idea you can't judge anyone when you step on a pickleball court you, you can't look at a body type and think I'm going to roll this guy. There's no, no problem. This person, they can't stay on the court with me because it doesn't matter how athletic you look or how tall you are or how short you are, uh, you know, what gender you are, how old you are. You know, if you know what to do and you understand that strategy part of it, you're, you can compete with anyone. Right, for sure. Uh, the kitchen is a, is a great equalizer. It's a great, uh, you know, it gives so many, so many tactics are available thanks to it. Um, uh, my first tournament, so I want to I want to think that I came with you know a good a good skill set to the sport after playing professional tennis, and I you know I'm playing these players that I feel like I'm I'm better than uh, better than, 
uh, but they are destroying me because they know how to play. They know how to use the kitchen well. They they know all the right tactics, the right shots. Um, so yeah, that's it, as much. The more I play the game, the more I learn that there's so much more to learn and so many more strategies. And and so when you talk about the kitchen, let's go to Riff. Riff, can you give us a little breakdown for some some people in the audience might not be familiar with the sport. Can you explain a little bit about what Doug was talking about with the kitchen and why it's a neutralizer? Yeah. So you know. I always say that uh, pickleball compared to all the other racket sports is like comparing checkers to, to, to chess. Uh, just as you said, it, you know, pickleball is much more strategic. And the reason that it can be uh, strategic is the inventors of the game really spent a great deal of time trying to not give an advantage to the taller player. And that immediately was displayed because we serve underhand. It's on a tennis type surface, it's cross court, but it's an underhand serve. So the height and the power that you can generate by doing an overhand uh, serve as you would do in other sports uh, is immediately taken away. The second thing that uh, was done is that uh, the server is actually at a disadvantage in pickleball because of the two bounce rule. So the receiving team, when they hit the ball, they have to let the ball bounce. They get to come up to the kitchen line first while the serving team has to stay back at the baseline. And just like in tennis, typically whoever has control of the net is going to win the vast majority of the points. So the seven feet on both sides of the net is considered the no volley zone area. And it is really what differentiates and allows the strategy of the game to develop. Because most of the other sports, you can get close to the net and it's easy to put the ball away. In pickleball, because of that seven feet, you can't penetrate that area by doing a volley. If the ball bounces in that area, then you can go in there and you can dink the ball back. That basic stroke that we see in pickleball where you see 60, 70 uh, hit rallies, typically a significant number of those are dinks. And a dink is just a soft shot that's going from one area of the kitchen, seven feet away from the net, somebody's hitting a soft shot uh, into that, opposing no volley zone area and you're trying to move your 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 opponents around you're you're looking to see how they're holding their paddle where they're holding their paddle and you're making decisions there where you could actually select four five six different shots at any time and as your game progresses certain shots that worked when you were a four row player don't work when you're a four or five because you're playing opponents that are ready for it and they can counteract it. And when you're a four or five and you're going to a five, uh, there's certain shots that you were doing that may have worked at the four or five, don't work at the five. And it's the same thing at the five oh to the pro. And you know what I find fascinating about this sport is that if you ask any elite athlete in any sport, you know how much they think they can improve in order to maybe get to on the Olympic award stand or win a national title. Um, it's usually like one or 2%. But, you know, I've seen Kyle Yates, who was our number one player in the world, Ben Johns just last year, or no, it was actually now a year and a half ago, uh, Deco was there as well, where we had World Pickleball Day. And that was the first time I'd seen Ben live in about three years, because I, I don't have time to go to tournaments. And I told Ben, I asked Ben, I said, the Ben that I see today would destroy the Ben from just three years ago. Do you agree with that statement? And Ben immediately said, absolutely. You know, in my mind, Ben has improved like 15%. And he was the world champion just a few years ago. And it's the same with Kyle. You know, it's, it's fascinating when your best players in the world still are finding ways to improve. And you heard Deckel say it, you know, he's still seeing room for improvement, new shots that you can learn, new patterns that you can develop. And, and that I think is really what's fascinating, even for the pros. And that's why I think the pros can stay addicted because there's always something new to learn. Yeah, and I think, I think it's a great point. And I think from what I see of the sport is that there are new strategies being invented right now in backyards somewhere across America or the world that yeah. are gonna change the game, right? We're seeing different styles evolve all the time, right? People are driving more than they used to drop. Um, lob is becoming a thing. Yeah. The spin serve. Someone just mentioned the controversy about the spin serve. Deckel's well aware of my spin serve. He doesn't like it. Uh, you know, there, there's a. It's you know, lethal. 
<laughs> there, there are new things popping up all the time. And that's part of the thing that I love about the sport is that it hasn't been cemented. There is no right way. Um, you can learn a way and then you can have iterations of that and try to improve your game. Um, so, yeah, so I think, I think that's, that's fantastic. Uh, do, do you want to definitely want to talk about, you know, the, the controversy around the spin serve? I just saw someone ask that question. Uh, definitely, let, let me just, let me just, I'll preface it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, when COVID came out, uh, they okayed the rules. So people wouldn't have to touch the ball that you could pop it up off your paddle and serve. And that was a kind of COVID protocol where people didn't want to touch the ball because other people had handled it. Um, but that brought into play the fact that you could actually spin it across the face of the paddle and generate spin. So a couple of players on the pro level started doing this and it had a real impact on the game. So then they banned that and they went back to, you have to toss it out of one hand, but you can generate spin uh, with that one hand. That becomes an advantage and you can spin the ball quite a bit and then, you know, hit the ball with some spin and it really jumps when it hits the ground. So the PPA, one of the pro tours has banned that at the pro level. And so Deckel plays on that tour uh, and he, you know, amongst other tours, uh, but he does not uh, use a spin serve. And we talked about this the other day. Uh, your thoughts on the spin serve, Deckel? Right. I think the big controversy is if, uh, does it help the sport? Uh, do people, you know, does it help it grow or does it keep it back? Uh, so that's the main, uh, I think, issue. A lot of people say it's, uh, it's good for the sport and it's innovative and it's uh, young people like to, to use it. So it's bringing more young people into the sport. Uh, and others are like, it looks really bad on TV. Uh, you know, people acing shorter points. We want the longer points and it's not what Pickleball intended. Uh, like the rules were intended for. So obviously two sides to it. Um, uh, my, you know, maybe Jason won't love my opinion on it, uh, but I, I like the, the no spin just because I like a more true bounce. And I think some of the courts, I'm, I'm saying more for the pro level um, are not like meant because some of the pros have like really uh, good spin serves and if you're playing not on a stadium court then it's a little bit difficult because the some of the courts are the fences are too close uh, but I think for for amateurs or for uh, for a girl play it's it's not as as important and uh, maybe and it should be kept maybe uh, but again that's uh, not for me to say um, but yeah it's uh, it's very it, it's it's been fun to watch what you know other uh, people's opinions are um on the subject and how uh, the, the sport keeps uh keeps growing and keeps you know there's so many changes every year to, to rules or to keep people just find new ways to be innovative and 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 get a better serve with with a spin serve with you know uh spinning off the paddle spinning it off their hands they get better at that then uh do the rules need to change i, I maybe maybe not because uh, maybe the sport is you know that's a, it's a way to grow the sport with uh uh doing things like that so yeah, I, I just find it fascinating, and I'm uh, wondering if more things like that will uh, will come to light as, as pickle grows because it just keeps booming, which is great. Yeah. So Riff, tell us a little bit about. I know we have some big news about Maccabi and pickleball. You want to talk about your role in in making this a reality and where we stand today? Yeah, sure. So. Um... 2017, I took a trip to Israel, introduced uh, pickleball, uh, did exhibitions at four different uh, iTech facilities. Uh, the pros loved it. Um, uh, I'd left uh, four nets, uh, you know, a couple hundred balls and 25 paddles. Uh, at all those clubs, the kids came out and played right away. There was laughter and the, uh, because the kids pick it up so quickly, it's uh, so much easier than tennis. Uh, I really thought that it would take off, but uh, unfortunately, you know, when I left, there was really nobody, no strong ambassador to carry the game forward. Uh, several years now go by, and I was back in Israel, and um, uh, I think the growth of the game in the United States, the acceptance of uh, the tennis community to pick a ball, I think Deckel's uh, presence being from Israel and also being one of the top players in the world, all those things I think have made a substantial and significant change. Uh, and so um, I had meetings uh, on this last trip with uh, uh, Maccabiah as well as with the uh, Israeli tennis centers. 
And I found out uh, last week, or no, this week, earlier this week, that we are officially approved as a um, exhibition in this year's Maccabea, and that the uh, uh, board will assist uh, World Pickleball Federation to meet the guidelines so that we can be accepted as a uh, participating sport in 2025. So uh, as, as people probably on this call are aware, uh, the Maccabea Games is uh, affiliated and approved by the International Olympic Committee. Um, so the very nature that uh, that is in place is a major, major step towards uh, pickleball, hopefully, uh, you know, somewhere down the road being accepted by the uh, IOC and, and uh, being uh, a, a sport uh, that we can get into the Olympics. And of course, you know, it's small steps. Everything that we've done over the last seven, eight years that I've been involved in the sport has been small steps towards that. But this is a, a, a major, major deal because, you know, the Maccabi Games are the third largest international sporting event in the world. You've got the Olympics, you got FIFA, and then you got the Maccabi Games. So the amount of exposure that pickleball is going to be able to get in Israel, uh, we're going to have four exhibitions at four different facilities, uh, and it's going to be done in concert with the tennis competition. And because the, 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 the uh, uh, levels of competition in the Maccabiya are the open, the uh, uh, seniors, uh, the juniors, and uh, what's, what am I missing? Um, maybe the adaptive? Uh, I, I can't remember what the fourth one is, but each one of those are at a different facility. So we'll be bringing you know, some of our top players. I hope the Deco will be one of them uh, and uh, we'll be able to do uh, exhibitions. Uh, and I think it'll be great for pickleball in Israel. Uh, it's already growing very quickly in Israel. Uh, they're already having tournaments now. I know I visited uh, Tel Aviv uh, and, and I think they've had two or three tournaments already in Tel Aviv and it's actively being played, I think, at eight of the centers. So, <clears throat> yeah, I know there's a big, I know there's a big push to get this in as an Olympic sport in 2028 yeah. in Los Angeles, uh, at least as an exhibition. Uh, so that's a great first step with Maccabi. That, that's fantastic. What do you think uh, is necessary to, to take this sport to the next level? Is there anything that it's missing? Is there anything that can be done uh, by the pickleball community to help get it more acceptance? And obviously, I'll preface it by saying this is the fastest growing sport in America. Uh, we have 4.2 million people playing this as of 2020. I think that number probably grew by 30% in 2021. Um, so we have probably 5 million or there or so people playing the sport or having played the sport. What can we do to, to get it even wider, wider acceptance? Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's just a lot of things that could be done. I'll just tell you some of the things that I'm trying to pay attention to. Um, uh, you know, we, I love the pros. And I love uh, uh, Deco. So let me say that first, right? The, the pros are the ones that give us all of the media coverage because everybody likes to see the best players in the world, right? But I will tell you that the future of the game has to be with the grassroots and that's at the recreational level with, among children. You know, so IPTPA has put, is putting together a major initiative to you know, get pickleball introduced at schools throughout the United States through the park districts throughout the United States. And we want to get a million kids, you know, introduced to pickleball this year. And out of that million kids, if 10% of them are like it is in most sports, they're going to kind of like pickleball and they're going to want to compete. They're going to want to get better. And out of that, you're going to end up with some of your next group of, of, of great juniors. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, seeing a bunch of really good juniors, you know, the guys like, you know, uh, Wyatt, uh, uh, and, uh, Stone and, 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 and many others. So I think, you know, growing from the bottom up is extremely important. Um, what I think needs to still be done and, and there's not as much attention being done here. I think that, uh, the two tours are, are, are on the way to doing it. Um, but we need to have, um, major sponsors. Uh, right now, the game has grown from the participation standpoint. What we really need to be able to do is to get more eyeballs watching pickleball. So that means TV, that means additional sponsorship, that means getting you know, uh, more people that uh, may not be playing pickleball, but talking about pickleball and coming to watch 
guys like Deckel and the other pros at you know some of these uh, major events. And and I think that's beginning to happen. Um, you know, just think that just three years ago we didn't have two tours. Now we've got two tours. So um, you know, we we've got guys like Steve Kuhn. You know, uh, we've got guys like Tom Candon that are coming in. These gentlemen are uh, experienced in the business world. They've got great connections. So all of these things I think are are beginning. Uh, but we need more of it, right? And and I think that it's a great story to tell because um, you know. Pickleball uh, players, you know, a lot of them travel to 20, 25 tournaments a year. So they're, they're go, they, they got to hop on an airplane. So you, you can get, you know, United of American Airlines to sponsor. Uh, they're, they're staying at hotels, you know, so there's a Marriott or a Hyatt. Uh, you know, there's people that are, you know, um, at my age or, uh, 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 that have some disposable income. So there's financial uh, company. So, so, you know, the, the, the story I think is a good story and, and I think it's an attractive one, uh, as far as a, a major sponsor and being able to get a return on their investment. Yeah. I, I think it also has a, has a, a branding problem, right? Pickleball, not probably the ideal name. Uh, obviously it, lots of different myths or, or reasons why it was called pickleball. Um, but that probably in hindsight, wasn't, maybe the best name to brand it. Cause I think it has a hurdle to overcome. It sounds silly. And I think that with uh, most people knowing the sport because they're maybe their grandparents played it, uh, you know, they, 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 in their mind, it's planted that it's a slower sport for older people. And the truth be told, we're seeing people, athletes like Deckel that are playing this at the highest levels. And it's incredibly, it's just really, I, I don't know if it was just luck or how it came about, but the, the, the serendipity of both physical and in the closeness and proximity to other people and the competitiveness and the strategy, it just works. And that's why I think people are so addicted to it and wanting to get better. It's like an onion. You keep on finding new layers to this game that, that keep on revealing themselves the more you learn and the more you play. Um, it, so it's really a very rewarding thing. Deckel, I, I'm going to follow up with you. Do you think there's anything that can be done to help accelerate the growth of the game that you see? Uh, I think uh, more courts built. It seems like uh, a lot of the, the parks and all, all of the places that pickleball is at, the courts are full. Uh, so more people want to play. I think more courts available in certain places, certain areas uh, will, help, will help that a lot. Uh, people will see the courts and 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 go play. Uh, there's a lot still. I feel like uh, a lot of places that uh, have shorter than courts, and even like Florida that had or California that have a lot of courts in them. Those parks are full. Those places are full, and uh, during like rush rush hour and whatever, like you have 30, 40 uh, courts that are completely full with a huge, uh, you know, huge weight. Uh, so I think the, having even more facilities, the, the courts are growing very fast, uh, but even even faster would be would be great. I know there is some uh, some talks about some uh, coming together from uh, uh, and doing some some initiative and lobbying for, for more courts or something like that. I think that would uh, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, and from what I heard, it's not out of reach. Um, so I think that would be that would be great. And obviously, like you said, uh, sh uh, sh you know, showcasing the 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 sports uh, and maybe with you know on tv better channels and better production and uh, maybe some stories behind the players so people are connected uh some uh, maybe just like uh the documentary that was just about uh like the um, uh it was race uh racing right the right. formula one uh which got a lot of people uh into it uh so something similar or something along those lines uh which will promote the sports in, in different ways. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think, you know, what we saw with Major League Pickleball and Steve Kuhn, who started Major League Pickleball, I thought the production values were fantastic. They had aerial cameras and kind of, you know, dollies on the side court. And it really made it look so much better than what we see week to week streaming for the the, the tournaments that, that are being played now. And so it was really a level up and you got to see, you know, we had video review and, and some higher tech capabilities, which I think helped. And when you start pouring money into the sport, I think it will pop off the screen and, and resonate with the audience. Um, For sure. I think, uh, I think it, it keeps improving, but there's still a lot more room for improvement. Uh, yeah, Steve has been doing a great job with Major League Pickleball and some other, other stuff he's doing. Uh, the PPA, the APP, both are 
both keep improving. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, still a lot more room to grow. And I think, I mean, pickleball is, is doing great right now. Uh, maybe, maybe for, for many years, it was, uh, it wasn't growing as, as, you know, maybe as it should have been because of the name, because of, uh, who knows what, but now in the past few years, it's, it's growing uh, very well. There's a lot of uh, good people that are, are, are doing good things. Uh, but yeah, still a lot of work and uh, it's just the beginning. So, Riff, let me ask you this. We're here for Maccabi. We obviously, I think the majority of the people watching this now are probably uh, Jewish. Uh, is there a connection with Judaism or the culture and pickleball? Because I can tell you, I play a lot of pickleball. I find a lot of Jewish people on the courts. And, and, and it's kind of funny how it attracts a certain type of, of person. Um, is there any connection, do you think? I, I, I don't really see a connection just to the Jewish people, but I think that Jewish people like the kibbutz uh, and, and you know, you're, you're in close proximity to each other. And whether you're seeing beginners or whether you're seeing pros, there's constantly chatter going on. And, and it's one of the beauties of the game because we're, you know, you get four people and, and we're close together. And so, you know, you're teasing each other and you get to know each other so much better than like on a tennis court. You know, I played tennis for 30 years. I made some great friends, but we were never talking during play because we're 120 feet away from each other, right? But now you come on a pickleball court, everybody's close to each other. And, you know, uh, the action is quick and it's fast and it's back and forth. And, you know, I, I often refer to pickleball like it's, it's a sport that's got yin and yang, right? I mean, it's slow, it's deliberate, it's patient, and you can win that way. And then all of a sudden, bang, 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 you know, it, it goes into this explosive, you know, fury. And, and then somebody resets the point, it's back to ding, 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 ding. I, I just, you know, I think that, that, that the, the uh, opposites uh, are so much a big part of the game and you really can win either way, but you need to be able to do both to, to really be a high level player. You can't just be, you know, one, one-sided, you know, you, you've got to be able to do all of it. And, and I think that's, you know, just a cool part of the game. Yeah. What, Deco, what about you? Have you seen any connection with Judaism in, in pickleball? Uh, I don't know if there's a direct connection, but I agree with you. There's definitely a lot of Jewish people uh, that, that play. Uh, constantly people uh, come up to me and, uh, and we talk about the, the subject and, and Israel. And uh, so, yeah, there's definitely, definitely something there, but I can't put my finger on it. Right. Got it. And, and, and let's talk about the demographic of the sport. I think that, you know, historically it's been seen as an older sport, uh, a little bit of a slower sport. And I think those are misconceptions. Obviously, it, 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 it allows for people of multi-generations to play, play together. Um, but, but what are we seeing in terms of the growth of the sport? Riff, maybe you, you can shed some light on that. So like three years ago, uh, the statistics said that the average pickleball player was 60.5 years old. Uh, that's no surprise because the, the, the game really exploded in the 55 plus communities. So the game was invented in the Pacific Northwest and it stayed in the Pacific Northwest pretty much, you know, for 30 plus years. As those people that grew up playing pickleball started to relocate into the Sunbelt areas of California, Arizona, Florida, they immediately, of course, brought pickleball with them. And so all those other people were, that were at those 55 plus communities started to play and everybody fell in love with it. And so they, that was the first thrust of pickleball into the spotlight. But it's fascinating that today, or I guess it was from 2020, uh, the, the age now is dropped all the way down to 43. So from 60 to 43 in just a matter of a few years, that's a tremendous drop. And it just shows that there's so many young people that are, that are getting into the game. And I think that that curve will drop significantly more if, as Deckel said, there were more courts available. Because, you know, if you're in the workforce, the only time you have to play is early in the morning or after work. And, you know, those courts are, are being booked. That's like prime time. So, you know, the, everybody's out on the courts at that time as well. So more courts mean greater opportunities for those that are in the workforce. Um, al along with, you know, developing programs for kids, you put all those things together. And, you know, to me, uh, you know, I've traveled all over the world and, you know, China alone can have 40 million in, in, in a couple of years. India could get 40 million in a couple of years. For us to have 100 million pickleball players is nothing. 
Yeah. It really isn't. So, so as fast as we think pickleball is growing, uh, it's still just the, the very beginning. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable what's happening and seeing it just absolutely, you know, explode across courts all over the place. Now, the other question I'd have to you is, 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 there, is there synergy between tennis players or tennis facilities and pickleball? We're, we're, I know there's a little bit of, uh, you know, friction uh, because well, I will tell you that I'm at a tennis facility right now. I did a, a workshop and, and be careful, be all, careful. Uh, all of the tennis teaching pros here. They all love pickleball. But, the, the, you know, when, when I first uh, introduced pickleball to a tennis club was in 2014, 2015. And the only reason I was able to get in is because I was a member here for 30 years and both of my kids played tennis here. And they allowed me to introduce pickleball. And so I taught uh, three uh, classes uh, every day, a beginner, intermediate, and advanced class. Um, and I will tell you, back then, the tennis community hated pickleball. Yeah. And, and I understand why, because, you know, very, very quickly, dormant tennis courts were being, you know, uh, uh, redone into pickleball courts, right? And you saw all these parks that had, you know, maybe in a week, they had four or five people playing. You take one tennis court and put in three or four pickleball courts, and now you've got 16 people playing on that court, where before you could only have two. And they're booked all day. So, you know, from the park district standpoint, you're, you're there to serve your community. And, you know, as the sport has grown, you could serve so many more people um, in a pickleball court as opposed to tennis. So, you know, that's one thing. But I think the tennis community has come around full circle. Um, they, you know, at one point actually put in rules so that um, any club that wanted to bring pickleball in, uh, and if they had blended lines on the tennis court, they would no longer be able to host any um, USTA tennis tournaments. And any significant tennis club across the United States, the lion's share of their profits come from those tournaments. So wherever we started to make sort of a, uh, some progress at the tennis clubs, that immediately came to a halt. But, you know, I think there were several things that happened all within a year that, that changed all that. Num the, the first thing that happened was, you know, when, when Larry Ellison said that he was going to host our national championships and, and put together a five-year uh, uh, a contract, that was a wake-up call to the tennis community. When you've got the, you know, fifth wealthiest guy in the world saying, hey, I, I'm putting, you know, some money in, into pickleball and, I, and, and, you know, one of the nicest facilities in the world literally, you know, redoes all their tennis courts to, to accommodate pickleball. That's a big deal. And then, you know, IPTPA developed a three-year partnership with USPTA, which was the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the main teaching arm of tennis. And so, you know, those two things, I think, were a real wake up to, to the tennis community. And uh, I think that, you know, a lot of the clubs that were not doing as well from a financial perspective realized that it's a lot smarter to bring in uh, pickleball people and just have blended lines uh, because you can get the seniors to come in and fill the court time during the day when, you know, they're, they're vacant. Um, you don't have to take a court out, which is what a lot of clubs were doing and putting in fitness equipment. You got to buy all the fitness equipment. You got to hire, you know, people that are special specialists or, you know, I've seen tennis clubs put in, you know, martial arts uh, 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 equipment. All those, there's much bigger investments that need to be made. And you're taking your most important commodity, which is your real estate out. With pickleball, it could still be a tennis court and a pickleball court. And, and, and the upshot to it is that you can get your good teachers can learn how to teach pickleball uh, and then they can supplement their income. So it's a win, win, win for everybody. You know, there's more courts available right away because you don't have to build anything. You're using the, the tennis courts as a multi-purpose area. So yeah, all, all those things I think are really, really, uh, you know, the, 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 the cornerstone to, to how pickleball and tennis has kind of gotten together and, and are much more compatible now than even three years ago. Yeah, I think there's no denying the, uh, the, the, the explosion in players and the demand for court you know, space. So uh, yeah, they're, not, they're no dummies. They, the, they go where the money is and yeah. uh, they're, they're making themselves uh, you know, available. 
Um, I think we want to bring on now Marty Einhorn to talk a little bit about a, a tournament that actually Maccabi USA is holding down in Davie, Florida. Hey, Marty, how are you? Hi, great. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much, Riff and Deco, for doing this, uh, taking your time. I wish we had another couple of hours to spend talking to you guys. But, um, maybe another time. And thanks, Shahar, uh, Frank. Uh, many of you don't know, but Shahar is the one who puts this together. So thank you. Um, I, uh, just like most of you on here, I'm a uh, <clears throat> old year, year old uh, pickleball player. Uh, who just fell in love with the game just a couple of years ago. And I have a long background uh, with uh, Maccabi and, and Israel and uh, Maccabi games. So I just, uh, you know, took this idea to, uh, to Maccabi USA and uh, we ran with it. Been working for a few months with already with uh, Shane Carr, who you all know from Maccabi USA and uh, Martina Coakley, our tournament director. Uh, Martina is on this call. She has lost her voice. I don't know if it was from teaching or from COVID or from yelling at her kids. I'm not sure. <laughs> she's, here, she's hearing everything, but she can't talk. So, um, But we've been working on this project for a number of months already. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, we're holding the inaugural Maccabi Pickleball Tournament, Maccabi USA Pickleball Tournament in Davie, Florida from Friday, April 1st to Sunday, April 3rd uh, at the JCC, at the Posnack JCC in Davie, Florida. Uh, um, we got, uh, we're getting all the cooperation we need from Scott Ehrlich, the uh, CEO there. Uh, so uh, shout out to Scott. Uh, it's gonna be a great event. And um, uh, the most important thing, the, the purpose of the tournament is twofold. First, to raise uh, funds in support of uh, athletes uh, participating in the uh, Maccabi this summer. And secondly, to help uh, uh, grow the sport in Israel, which uh, Riff has been talking about. Um, uh, a bunch of us hope to be there al along with him in, in the summer during the games to do those exhibitions, and that's great. We're also, during, during this tournament that we're running, we're gonna be collecting paddles uh, use paddles for all the participants or anybody who wants to bring them down to the to the tournament to to bring or send over to Israel so there'd be more paddles uh, for kids to use down there. Um, so uh, I hope that everyone here will e decide either to play in the tournament if you can, uh, if you're down in Florida or if you're coming down, uh, or spread the word to as many people as you can. Again, especially if you know people in the South Florida area who are close by. Um, or anybody that you know wants to come down and have vacation and play some pickleball. Um, also, Marty, 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 let me just jump in real quick. Is there truth to the rumor that they're giving away a million dollars if you can beat Deckel at the tournament? Is that right? <laughs> uh, well, unfortunately, I know Deckel really wanted to be there, but we're going to have to excuse him. He's going to be playing in an APP tournament in Arizona. I um, wish I could. Yes. Deckel, you ruined it. We've been I'm twisting sorry, I'll try, try, to, try to be there for the next one and maybe we can have that challenge then. A deal, there you, there you go. A million dollars paid by you, Jason, yeah. Yeah, Steve <laughs> Kim will put the money up. I've talked to him, it's fine. So the tournament is listed on pickleballtournaments.com. We've been getting, uh, we started off, registration started off very slowly, but it's been growing and growing now. We can handle up to 300 uh, players on 12 courses that we're gonna have there, so please, uh, encourage people to to register. Uh, also, if you if they if somebody cannot play, there's a link on the pickleballtournaments.com uh, site for non-participant donations. So if somebody can't uh, play but wants to still donate to the cause, they can do that. We've gotten some nice donations already through that. Um, we have uh, Martina can't talk, like I said, but she has uh, secured a, a few matching funds also in the thousands of dollars. So every, everything that we raise from this tournament will be matched by uh, some, some people that we know. Um, and uh, that's, uh, let me see, I'm looking at my notes to see if I'm leaving anything. Oh, obviously all, of, all ages, all levels uh, will be uh, covered in the tournament. So encourage everybody to play. Also, if anybody here wants to be a become a sponsor of the tournament, please let me know. My contact information is also on the pickleballtournaments.com site. 
Um, so you can reach me through that or reach Shane at Maccabi USA. Uh, and uh, that's about it. Thanks. Hope right. to see everybody there. Thanks, Marty. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great event. I'm going to try to go down and play. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. I encourage everybody to come down and play. We're also going to post that in the kitchen uh, on Facebook. I encourage everybody, if you want, come and join the kitchen. If you want to learn more about pickleball and, and hear about, you know, how the sport is moving and, and catch up on everything, uh, just find us on Facebook at the Kitchen Pickleball. Um, uh, Jason, that, excuse me, Jason. Yeah. Excuse me, just one more thing. Yeah. Um, keep an eye out for that, for those kinds of announcements on the kitchen. And uh, also we've been all over all of the forums, especially down in, in, in Florida, advertising the tournament. And we also have some uh, people that are putting together, to, together some videos for us that we're gonna put out there pretty soon. Uh, Dekel, I'm waiting for yours to come through. Um, yes, coming soon. Calling you out, Dekel. Uh, Martina is doing one. Megan Hall, another professional player who's playing in the tournament. Is, is doing one. And we already have one from Ben Johns ready to go out there, uh, encouraging people to play in the tournament. So we'll, th those things will be coming soon. Excellent. That's yeah, great. you guys should go to it. It'll be a great one. Yes, absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, I'm not sure, Shahar, do we have time to take some questions from, from the audience or should I just read these or how, how are we on time? Um, we can have five minutes for a question, that's great. Um, you can go over, if anyone have questions, you can write down in chat. We'll try to cover them in five minutes. And um, if not, I guess uh, we, you will either need to um, go online, look for the question, the answers on, or you can email us and we can try and help you. Okay, okay. I was watching, I was monitoring the, the, the chat throughout. So I think we got most of the questions that were asked. Um, Dekel, one last question for you. Are you still playing any tennis or are you done with tennis and you're 100% pickleball? I'm playing uh, tennis occasionally, not much. Uh, I want to play a little bit just to, you know, it's still a fun sport that I like, uh, but definitely uh, a lot more pickleball. Has, has, has it ruined your tennis game? Uh, no, it hasn't ruined it. Uh, I think maybe not playing uh, for a long time uh, tennis uh, for one period didn't do great for my tennis game. I think that is more of a, uh, that's probably it. But no, uh, if anything, it probably helped me with a couple of things. So, Shane, sorry, sorry, Shane just asked, who are the influential women in the game? Uh, obviously, we have players and we have administrators. Uh, Melissa McCurley, uh, who runs Pickleball, uh, tournaments.com is very influential. Uh, some of the top women, uh, uh, Dekel, you want to rattle off some names? Uh, yeah, I mean, you have uh, some of the, the top players like uh, Simone Jardim. Uh, um, I mean, uh, you, named, you named a lot there. Um, not, nothing comes to mind, but there are definitely, definitely a few that are. Uh, right, the waters. Really the waters, the waters yeah. Of and, course, uh, uh, Catherine Perinto, Perint uh, Jesse Irvine. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of great, a lot, yeah, a lot of great top uh, uh, female players who, you know, who are doing great for the game. Um, yeah, no, it's it's great to see. Okay, yeah, I mean, you know, please tune in if you haven't watched. The tournaments are streaming on the weekends. Uh, you can find them on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, they're on ESPN Plus and Fox Sports Two. Um, so if you look for it, Tennis Channel as well, if you look for Pickleball, you will find it. Uh, it, is, it is getting the reach that it deserves, and uh, hopefully you guys watch. Because I know if, you, if you're not familiar with the pro players, it's a little bit of a disconnect. But once you understand the personalities and what's happening, it becomes a lot more fun. Uh, the Davy Tournament, only for Jews. No, the Davy Tournament is not for Jews only. It is a multi uh, very welcoming event. Anybody who wants to play some pickleball is welcome to play. Uh, I think that is it. Shane, do you want to do you want to wrap up here, or am I doing this? I just want to say thanks. Thanks to you, Jason. Appreciate you taking the time. Seymour Rifkin, Deco Bar. It's amazing. Thanks for being part of our community and and sharing about pickleball. 
And Marty, thanks for all the work you're doing with our tournament in April. We hope to see you there. For those of you who are uh, fans of our show, this show is going to return on February 22nd. We have a preview of Major League Baseball with two uh, commentators, Kurt Bloom and Alex Cohen. So keep an eye out on your email inboxes. Uh, Donna and, uh, and Arnie will be back on the 22nd of February. And uh, stay warm, everybody, and, and have fun. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And hey, Shane, if I just throw this out there for the baseball people, since you're throwing out a baseball thing, I met a kid. I was traveling in Costa Rica over Christmas, and I met a kid named Josh Wolf, who is a pitcher from the Cleveland Guardians now. Uh, he throws 98 miles per hour. He's a second round draft pick. Watch for him. He's going to play for uh, Israel in the World Baseball Classic. Super nice kid. Sandy Kofax in the making. Yeah, he's, he's going to be awesome. So, uh, so look for him. All That's right. amazing. Cool.